Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. It's a tremendous task. Improving gun safety in Louisiana schools. One is too many, but 53 is, is way too many. The rebound of West Nile virus. By actually getting rid of this rodent, we're actually saving the wetlands. We preview rodents of unusual size. Hi everyone, I'm Andre Morrow. Much more on those stories in a moment on this week's edition of SWI. But first, another national credit rating agency has an improved view of Louisiana finances. S&P Global boosted the outlook from negative to stable. Same thing that Moody's did back in July. They say the improvement comes from the legislature, the seven-year sales tax renewal that gives us some budget stability. And now let's look at other headlines across Louisiana. The Army Corps of Engineers has endorsed the plan to deepen the main channel of the Mississippi River from Baton Rouge to the Gulf to 50 feet. The Corps estimates the plan will mean benefits of $100 million to the nation's economy compared to average annual costs of almost $18 million. The White House and Congress must approve the final proposal. A once highly touted economic deal with Bell Helicopters in the state has soured into lawsuits. LED Secretary Don Pearson this week ended the deal after, quote, four years of underperformance by the company, end quote. The state spent $26 million to build a home in Lafayette for Bell to assemble choppers and create jobs. Bell offered the state $16 million two years ago to end the deal, but says it's no longer willing to pay that termination penalty. The state's unemployment rate continued rising in July, showing an uptick for a fourth straight month. The jobless rate rose to 4.9 percent from 4.7 percent in June. The number of unemployed here is now about 105,000. In contrast, July's U.S. unemployment rate falling to 3.9 percent from 4 percent in June. State Superintendent of Education John White says salaries for Louisiana public school teachers need to be raised. The latest figures show our teachers are paid just shy of $50,000 on average, while the national average is more than $58,000 annually. Governor John Bell Edwards says he hopes to recommend to lawmakers an increase in public school financing next year to help pay for teacher raises. When thousands of state college students returned to classes this week, they found it's costing more to get their education. The LSU and Southern University systems enacted campus-wide fee hikes of up to 5%. The fee charges aren't covered by TOPS. Full-time students on LSU's main campus are now paying $282 more per semester. The State Department of Health is urging that people take precautions to guard against West Nile virus. Louisiana has the most cases of the virus in the country. We talked with Dr. Ronnie Whitfield, who has a family medicine practice in Baton Rouge. We're in the peak of mosquito season from summer into fall, and the presence of West Nile virus is suddenly raising red flags across the U.S., and particularly in Louisiana. West Nile is most commonly spread to people by mosquito bites. The CDC reports that as of August 7th, 40 states and the District of Columbia have reported West Nile infections in people, birds, and mosquitoes this year. The Louisiana Department of Health is reporting two and a half times more cases than a year ago. 53 cases this year compared to 21 this time last year. So that gets your attention. Oh, without a doubt, one case gets your attention because it's just something that you don't anticipate happening. We Physicians know about West Nile and it, it you know, it was one of those things when it first came out, everybody was scared. It's kind of like with SARS and everything, we really panic and freak out. 
But now, you know, there had been some, some I guess, it, things had calmed down a little bit. But for we to have a resurgence this year, definitely get your attention. One is too many, but 53 is, is way too many. Of those 53 cases, nine were asymptomatic or showing no symptoms. 13 developed West Nile fever, in which people experienced flu-like symptoms. 31 developed neuroinvasive disease, the most serious type of illness associated with the virus. It infects the brain and spinal cord and can lead to brain damage, paralysis, or even death. Why is it that, that there's not something that if you have the worst form of it, why can't it be treated? Again, it's a viral illness, like HIV is, like a common cold is. There's no treatment for the virus. Um, we only treat the symptoms. So if you come in the hospital and you're dehydrated, you're vomiting, nausea, we tr simply try to palliate you, treat the symptoms, and hope that you improve. But if it takes a turn for the worst, there's very little that, that we can do. The CDC says one in 150 people infected will see the worst of it. You can get encephalitis, inflammation of the brain, meningitis and, and uh, inflammation of the meninges, the things that cover the brain, and it can kill you. You got to use your universal precautions, you know, long sleeve clothing. If you're applying mosquito repellents with DEET, which you don't want to use in infants, I got a newborn, so I know not to use that. There's special uh, repellents for the younger children, and you don't want them outside that long anyway. But you use those skin the repellents and reapply if you're sweating or in the swimming pool to protect yourselves. If you can do some mosquito abatement around the home, there's all kinds of new treatments and those types of things. But just being, being cautious, being aware. And if you do present with some bizarre symptoms after being outdoors, that could be dehydration from the sun. And we've talked about heat illness and injury too, but it could also be a viral illness that you may have gotten from one of those mosquitoes. So you need to seek physician's care immediately, even though there's no treatment. The earlier that we detect something in you or something that you're exposed to, the, the better the treatment will be. The CDC recommends that you carefully follow the directions to apply mosquito repellent. Look for any standing stagnant water around your home and drain it because it's a prime breeding ground for mosquitoes. It's fortunate that most people infected with West Nile will not have symptoms. About one in five will have fever or other symptoms. The majority of the people, I think over 80%, are asymptomatic, have no symptoms, don't know they have it. You would find out that you were infected by West Nile if some other blood tests were being done and they were screening for diseases. When they do blood draws, I mean, they always check you for hepatitis and HIV. West Nile is now becoming a part of that test because we have to be cautious about it. And so you don't want to uh, transfuse an infected blood into someone else, and that's why we do the testing. Our thanks to Dr. Ronnie Whitfield for that interview. The State Department of Health updates their numbers each week. Among those 53 human cases, they are now reporting two deaths. Now, in the wake of the deadly February school shooting in Parkland, Florida, Governor John Bell Edwards assembled a commission with a variety of stakeholders to look at safety in Louisiana schools. With school back in session, LPB's Kelly Spires checked in with State Police Superintendent Colonel Kevin Reeves. As students are coming back to school this August, what are they seeing on their campus that might be different than what they left? Truly, we're hoping they're not experiencing anything different on their campuses. We're hoping that uh, what we're doing is something that's not going to be easily noticeable by them or affect their ability to interact in the nurturing environment of the school. The Safety Commission uh, enacted by the governor was really to bring together uh, law enforcement, education and other stakeholders into a conversation about how we can make our schools safer. And it's a broad body. We broke it into two phases. We partnered, state police partnered with the Sheriff's Office, the City Police, and uh, the Department of Education, the Superintendent's Office, and also the principals of the schools to go around and evaluate all the schools within the state of Louisiana and, uh, and take a look at things such as uh, entryways and, and exit areas and also technology and uh, other things such as that that maybe we could uh, see if there's some things we could, might be able to do better. Assessing every school sounds like a lot of work. It's a tremendous task um, and, and let me say on the onset we couldn't have done it alone. Uh, it's a partnership and it's a true partnership between the Department of Education and law enforcement to include the Sheriff's Office and the City Police uh, who are the, actually the primary oh, yeah. Uh, agencies that are responsible for things such as school resource officers. You mentioned the term school resource officer. What exactly is that? 
A school resource officer is a local law enforcement officer from the Sheriff's Office of the City Police that's provided to the school uh, to provide a safer environment for the school. But the school resource officer oftentimes gets uh, painted as, you know, more of a true law enforcement function, and, and they are, but they also allow for the law enforcement to interact with the kids in a positive way and, uh, and let the kids get to know the law enforcement officer and, uh, and hopefully build uh, that, that arena of trust between law enforcement and the students. We just, uh, the ultimate goal of a school resource officer is to make sure that not only do we provide a safe environment for the kids, but that they feel that safe environment. They feel that sense of security. And, uh, and for the parents also to know when you drop your kids off at school that they're, they're being provided with the safest environment we can. I've heard that making it so there are less entry points to a school um, is a low impact thing to make things safer. Um, is that something that we're seeing in lots of schools? Well, I tell you, uh, ultimately, sure, we would like to go to a single point of entry at all schools. Uh, and I did forget to mention earlier that the fire marshals were also a part of our evaluation team that went because, you know, there's certain laws that govern, rules that govern being able to get in and out of facilities because of fires. So we brought them on board and they were a critical part of us looking at uh, how, how we can adjust how kids come in and exit schools. Mental health is always something that comes up in conversations involving school and gun safety. How does mental health figure into what y'all are doing? They are actually, uh, we do have members from mental health, uh, from the guidance counselors uh, association and some mental health executives and, uh, and practitioners that are also on the uh, long-term commission that's gonna look at some different ways to try to make our school safer. What are the long-term plans of the Safety Commission and when do you think everything will wrap up? Long-term commission, they'll look at uh, financing, you know, grants and stuff that will help, because you know everything, you, you gotta have money to solve problems. I know a lot of the individual school districts are applying for some grants that can be uh, applied back to the schools to help us increase safety. Technology, you know, we looked at uh, camera systems, we looked at communication systems from in the classrooms, uh, you know, it's just a wide variety of things that we looked at to try to enhance the safety of the students. Uh, another thing that the Long Range uh, Blue Ribbon Commission will be looking at will be legislation. Uh, we'll look at the current laws uh, that are governing activities around schools and sh is there some room for improvement in that? Is there some room for, it's not to say that the laws we have aren't good, but we live in a changing world and from time to time to reevaluate those and see if there's any changes we can make is always something we should be doing. As far as when it's gonna wrap up, I really don't know that this is ever gonna wrap up. Uh, when it comes to school safety, I think that we need to be in a constant state of evaluation and reevaluation of where we're at. Well, thank so, you so much. Thank you for having me. While we are on the subject of schools, this month, Louisiana Public Square explored the power of reading. Louisiana's literacy rate is far below the national average, so LPB brought stakeholders together to discuss how that problem can be addressed. Robin Merrick moderated the event. It took place at Baton Rouge Community College. First, we want to hear from Brandy. She's one of our second grade teachers of English language arts here in Louisiana. She's doing some exciting things in her classroom. Brandy. When students um, have that choice in the books they're reading, whether it's in class or at home, then they really take an active role in the furthering their knowledge. So we have taken the, the stand of also giving them a choice in the pieces of writing that they are writing in our class because literacy no longer just encompasses reading, it's also writing. My reason for going back at this time is just unfinished business. I have grandchildren that I'd like to um, poor and so into, and I need to be able to give them the best of me. And with that, I can't lead by example if I'm not that example. We actually host three book festivals in St. Francisville, Louisiana that draw people from around the country. I'm gonna flip the script a little bit. And Gerard, you have a, a different spin on this in terms of the economic impact of reading, particularly as you work with workforce development here at the Baton Rouge Community College. Tell us a bit about that. Everything we do in workforce development is based on literacy skills. Walding is, is, a, is pretty much a, a theory-based practice, kind of mm -hmm. like playing a musician, just like a, being an artist. Welding is something that is still hands-on, but even with the new technology of artificial intelligence, robots, and automation, 
you still need a function of welding, but there's new procedures that you still have to read on a daily basis. You can't go to and say, hey, Jim, I need you to tell me this procedure. Well, Jim's going to grow. He's going to grow on his field. I'm going to be left behind. I keep thinking about To Kill a Mockingbird and how um, everybody relates to that book because uh, I think I was scout. I've, uh, you know, I've always re related well to that book. But the key, I think, is to talk about literature. You can catch the rebroadcast of Louisiana Public Square, The Power of Reading, tonight, that's Friday at 8 p.m. You can stream the show also online at lpb.org slash public square, and you can do that right now. The neutral took over. So we got to keep fighting them. That's a clip from a film you can see this weekend about a menace to Louisiana's vanishing coast. Rodents of unusual size will be showing in Shreveport, Baton Rouge, and New Orleans, and it's about the nutria. This invasive 20-pound South American rodent that loves to eat up wetlands. Jeff Springer and Quinn Costello are two of the film's co-directors. There are three of you guys, but let me ask you, how did you come to do this film? Well, I think we're both um, we're all interested in um, interesting environmental stories, and we and Chris and I had heard about the story of quite a few years ago. Chris is one of your other. Yeah, yeah. and and we just thought Very it was an interesting and you know an, an environmental story, but it's unexpected. It's like by actually getting rid of this rodent, we're actually saving the wetlands. So well, where did the tip come from to do this, though? Well, I met uh, a woman, a friend who just got this job in New Orleans, who uh, was in charge of trying to eradicate them around Lake Pontchartrain. And I was like, you're eradicating what? Right. She's like, well, these large rodents that, of course, that people are eating and wearing and hunting and all these different <laughs> things. I was like, wow, and all these people that she kept describing. You trace the Nutria timeline to Louisiana, which is all pretty fascinating, too, and then how the population exploded. Talk about that. Some. Well, they were brought from South America, from Argentina, and for fur farms in the 30s and 40s. And then they basically, they're either released or, or storms, they, they get loose, and they start, um, the population starts growing. And then people that were trapping muskrat and things noticed that, oh, they could sell these furs too. And so it kind of kept them under control. But when fur fell out of fashion in yeah. the 80s, that's when the, the animals no longer had, there's no natural predator. So once man wasn't hunting them anymore, then they really got out of control. The state did try for a brief while to get people to eat them out of existence. And that campaign- Other than dogs, it's not- too, Right, right. Too now now there's a company, Marsh Dog, that is having <laughs> success making them into dog biscuits. But right. uh, but overall, uh, the proposition of eating nutria to the point where they wouldn't be a problem was just not acceptable to uh, Louisiana. And so they settled on this program that pays people five bucks a tail to hunt them. Which we get into the bounty hunter and then the, the fashion aspect of it. And, uh, and that's where you meet a bunch of characters that are actually not characters at all. They're people who live off the land and work mm -hmm. in Louisiana. Yeah, like some really genuine people. And, and you know, it helps them support their livelihood when, they're, when it's not crab season you know, or alligator season, there's the nutria. And, and then there's people that see it's a huge waste. So, you know, um, these people that are using, they wanna use them as clothes, it's like if they can create a demand for these, you know, for the fur, then there'll be more incentive to go after them and hunt them. What is the most fascinating aspect of this film? And now that you see it uh, in its entirety, and I do wanna ask you, is there a longer version and a shorter version for yeah. the theaters and for television? There is. We're having, you know, our theatrical run now, Baton Rouge on Sunday and New Orleans for the next week, Shreveport also on Sunday. But uh, I think that one of the things that is um, kind of interesting to me is how much the nutria have been absorbed into the culture in yeah. Louisiana. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, people really uh, understand them as this scourge, you know, but at the same time, they're like, well, there are scourge, they you know, them anyway. and they're so unique. And so in a way, you know, so they're going to be the mascot of baseball teams and people are going to raise them <laughs> as pets and all these different things. And they're going to kill a lot of them in the meantime, but, you know, they're also kind of loved and admired in their own little way. Well, they thank have their you. Fans. Yeah. Thank you so much. The film is terrific. And I want to tell you how people can see it.
uh, this weekend in Shreveport on Sunday the 26th at 6 p.m. at the Robinson Film Center in Baton Rouge on Sunday. That's also the 26th of August at 2 p.m. That's at the Manship Theater. And in New Orleans beginning the, today, the 24th through the 30th at the Zeitgeist Multidisciplinary Arts Center. The film will air on LPB in December, right here on LPB in December, and then nationally on PBS early next year. It's a great film to watch. We are sad to say this week that Louisiana blues legend Leslie Lazy Lester Johnson passed away at his home in California. Just last year, LPB captured fellow abuse musician Kenny Neal and Johnson playing music together before they sat down for an interview with us. Oh, the patrol, why you got me? Put me in, put out in jail. And I know my dad, Ray Neal, and you and him started back in the early 50s. Was that 55, 56? No, before then. What year you were born? I was born in 57. Ah, we was dead and already. I caught the bus going to, going to rain, and, and Lightning Slim was on the bus. And I knew who he was, but he didn't know Lightning who I Slim. was. Lightning Slim, I like Lightning Slim. Yeah. He, he, I knew him, but he didn't know me. Okay. And... Um, I said, where you going, Lightning? And he said, who is this little me? I said, well, my name is Leslie Johnson, man. I said, I know you. He said, but I don't know you. And we just sat there and talked. I didn't say anything about music or nothing of that kind. I, uh, I didn't tell him that I was on stage with his band or nothing of that kind. So when we got to rain, I said, I'm going I'm to go on out here and see what's all this music stuff about that y'all doing. Because he said he's going to record. He said, well, Lightning? What we gonna do for a harmonica player? Mr. Smarty Mouth say, well, I can I can play better than that if I heard now. And he looked at me and said, what? I said, I can play better than that what I heard on those records. He said, oh, you gotta be kidding. I said, go get me an A and a G because I had old beat up B flat in my pocket. He went and got me an A and a G and when, when he brought it to me, I reached and got Lightning's K and tuned it I said, Lightning, let me hear what you got. And he did, and I fell in with the harmonica. Jim Miller jumped up. He said, well, I'll be damned. Looking for him and got him right here with me. He said, why didn't you tell me? I said, you didn't ask. And that was it. That was his harmonica. And then you started recording from there on. From that, you started from getting that, your record deal. Wow. I started playing with him. Right place at the right time. Uh, yep. But I played on the road with Sundown before I started playing with Lightning. And I recorded with Lightning before I recorded with Sundown. Lonesome Sundown. Mm -hmm. And then I recorded my first one in 1953, and it came out in 54. And what was the name, what was the name of that record? I'm gonna leave you, baby. I'm gonna leave you, baby, and let's stomp. 1953? Yeah. I got him right. I got him right here, and then that rest of it is history. Oh, long time to straighten something out and tell you. They got all this junk about who Rick, who was on that Slim Hoppo King B. I'm tell you, James Taylor. He was, that was a guitar player. These are the people that was on Scratch My Back. Yeah. I never James, didn't know James that. James Taylor, Matthew Jacob, Boogie Woogie Jake, and little Pee Wee Johnson, you know, from Baton Rouge. Know him, yeah. That's who was on that record. And I, I would have been there at the time, but Sundown and I was out on the road. When I came back that Monday, I caught, when came in the shop and uh, and Jay said, Lester, I got something I want you to hear. I just recorded a guy from Baton Rouge called himself Harmonica Slim. And um, he said, it sounds like it's something missing in this. So he put it on and, and I'm, I'm listening. Mm, I said, yeah, there's something missing. So I went over to my box and I got me a cardboard box and a, a brush. And I got to go there and I said, back it up, slide it off. Well, I'm a king bee, do, 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 mm. And that, that, pop, that, he said, that, threw up both thumbs. He said, 
With that little that little that, slide that, that, you that, did that, on the King B. That 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 slap on that cardboard box. That's where that beat is. So that and that's you. Yeah, on King B. Yeah. That's on that. On and that song went on to be recorded oh, by the Rolling oh, Stones. Everybody, man. And a whole bunch of more people. Yeah. I haven't recorded wow. it yet, but I'm going to record it. <laughs> it's been a long, long time since I've seen her smiling face. Say. I'm down here in the prison. Someone else that took my place. Lazy Lester was 85. And that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download is free from your app store. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows and other Louisiana programs that you've come to enjoy over the years. And please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Support comes from... Entergy provides much more than power. We support science and engineering at local schools to build a brighter path to better jobs and help prepare the next generation. Because together, we power life. Entergy. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting, with support from viewers like you.